Our next speaker, uh, Jan Eckert, design education at the dawn of new pedagogies. So welcome, uh, welcome Jan. Good morning, welcome. And thanks for, wow, it's that, that smooth and perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> we do try, we do try. Great. Um, so shall I just start off? Uh, yeah, if you'd like to start your presentation. Fantastic. So I will try to keep eye contact, but I think <laughs> as soon as I launch my presentation, <laughs> my image will disappear. But at least I'm standing. That is something I've learned. If you, if you like, I can, I can place you on the side. Or I can, if I cannot, if you, well, I can why not? Yeah, maybe okay. that makes yeah. fe people um, feel a bit more involved and me as okay. well. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I can and another that. thing that I've learned during the pandemic, maybe refer referring to the conversation we just had before, is I learned to stand. So I'm not sitting anymore. I got a nice standing table here. So if you see me moving around, that's because I like to move around, and you can join in too. <laughs> that's, that's very that's very important. That's very very important what you're saying. Great. So let me share my screen here. Mm -hmm. We did that that's before, and it should work. Okay, here we go. Uh, yes, and um, so if you see my presentation uh, now, this? everything went well. And Perfect. perhaps if you place me as a little tiny image into the corner, then that feels uh, a bit more personal than just staring at the screen. So my name is Jan, Jan Eckert. I'm head of the design unit at the University of Gothenburg uh, up in Northern Europe here in Sweden. And I would like to talk about Design at the Dawn of New Pedagogies. Um, and the subtitle of, of my talk today is kind of um, indicates already what it is a bit about. It's about the change, the, the, the ongoing change in higher education that um, what we've been used to as a, as a rather linear uh, learning biography, maybe starting with elementary school and college, high school and, and um, and some sort of university with then bachelor's and master's is more and more extending into a network of non-linear linear learning experiences. And especially if we think about uh, lifelong learning, that kind of uh, learning biography really extends into a lifetime rather than just a chunk of your life. Um, so I would like to talk uh, about um, the VUCA world of uh, education today. Then I would like to share a few words why I believe design won't be even enough to meet that vuca of the world of education. And then um, lastly, I would like to share some thoughts about how I think both design stands at the dawn of its pedagogies and also design can contribute a lot uh, to uh, the pedagogies that are undergoing a fundamental change, especially in higher education. Uh, so let's start with the VUCA world of education. So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And um, it's, it's a term that is currently being used for a lot of, let's say, complex situations. You could say like uh, the entire topic around uh, and the, the challenges we face within the context of climate change. That is something that vuca uh, relates a lot to. And why I think... Um, the world of education or the educational system as we know it mainly or my experience mainly ties up to the central uh, european educational system is um, is also driven or influenced by uh, volatile and certain complex and ambiguous factors more and more um, a couple of years ago i held a speech or a keynote uh, in castelo branco portugal during the imat conference and um, it was about curricular development within the design domain. And um, I shared this, um, this diagram uh, that is based upon both my, my experience as a student, but also as a design educator, that um, if we take a look at, at what was design education about, maybe let's say in the, in, in the, until the, the late nineties, it was still a lot about a professional career. career. So, um, and if you kind of you know um, yeah think about what that was aiming at, uh, there was a lot of discussion around the term of employability. Should universities and uh, colleges or schools of arts and design um, 
feed into the employability of, of its students. Um, but this was mainly tied to the observation or the goal to uh, yeah to be in and uh, to be able to transition into one or a couple of professional careers. Now we d we know that nowadays we're not not having just one perspective there. It, we're talking really about multiple professional careers. Um, and so it's it's more and more becoming about compatibility than employability. And if we kind of go forward a bit in thinking. Uh, what we are more and more facing, if we take a look at complex challenges such as the one I mentioned, uh, climate change or others, uh, uh, we become more and more, more and more aware that it's not about one professional or multiple professional careers, maybe professions or disciplines uh, kind of um, fade into themes and challenges more and more. So the key word here is really cooperation. How do we educate um, our current and future generation of learners to be able to cooperate to tackle these massively complex challenges right and then uh, heading ahead in in uh, in time uh, the question could be like uh, what if work as we know it nowadays um, changes changes is its meaning from being a rather existential activity towards maybe something that is maybe yes existential, but in in, a, in another uh, in another meaning, in another term. So it becomes more a question of purpose. And if we zoom into what I've been just uh, for, talking through, um, and this again is both based upon my observations. So it's not uh, there's no like clear st statistics behind the the next few slides. It's it's my experience as a student, as an educator as someone who has developed uh, several programs um, in the design uh, domain. And it's it fed, it's fed by a lot of um, research done by other people. And I will refer here and there to that. So uh, simply speaking, job profiles now, they are becoming less and less clear. So if the, if the X axis at the bottom is the timeline, um, if I think back when I started as a student, uh, I would I, I enrolled a program in, in interior architecture, and that was a clear job profile. Now, uh, these profiles are becoming less and less clear. And at the same time, the complexity of problems that we are meant to tackle as professionals is increasing. Um, and this is not just my observation. If you take a look in, in some of the reports that are being published, maybe create the Creative Economies report that is um, published on a regular basis in the UK. There is a similar uh, report in other countries as well. Uh, uh, one of the reports that is being published on a regular basis, also the Jobs of Tomorrow or Jobs of the Future report um, by the World Economic Forum. And so this is not something that just relates to the design domain, but to, let's say, our, our occupational world as a whole. Now, uh, again, thinking back in time when I started studying, it was pretty normal at my uh, university in, uh, in Stuttgart, Germany, that people would study 17 semesters in uh, architecture, for instance, so nearly 10 years, right? That was, of course, before bachelor's and master's have been introduced in Germany. Um, but at the same time, these kind of roughly 10 years of studies would somehow relate or enable you to engage for 10, 20, in some cases, even 30 or 40 years of work in the professional domain, right? Now, we all know this is, has drastically changed and uh, the half-life of job-related knowledge and skills is becoming less and less, especially if I see sometimes uh, students applying for a master's program uh, while coming from a distance, uh, different dif um, discipline. So, of course, there is no way these people will gain the same depth of knowledge and skills compared to someone that has been already on the same discipline for three years. So, uh, as we can see on the bottom line, more and more we have maybe people that engage in three years of studies and then transition di directly into the job world. Maybe we have some people who come back after some experience in the job world and, and study for one to two years on an MA program. Um, a recent uh, phenomenon is uh, we have um, more and more educational programs being offered at part-time studies. Recently, I came across a 30-plus program that is uh, offered for uh, people being maybe on the job for five to ten years coming back. Um, so clearly, we're heading towards lifelong learning strategies here. 
And if we take a look now at uh, what is called discipline or still is being considered a discipline in the higher educational world, um, until people would, let's say, study three years plus two years in the same that, um, discipline um, by uh, studying on a bachelor's plus master's, we would have more or less, you know, a cohort of learners on the same discipline. Now, this is, of course, decreasing more and more people, um, you know, might learn on the job, come back and realize, oh, now, now compared to my design skills, I need some management skills uh, as well. Or the other way around, I've been um, studying and working in business administration, and now I think I, I need that kind of design component. This is also, by the way, where many schools of management um, and economy are offering uh, design uh, programs or so-called design programs or minors in design. Um, so basically, more and more learners are leaving the, the educational silos. Now, uh, some numbers I can refer to here when I was director of uh, three MA programs in design back in Switzerland at Lucen University of Applied Sciences and Arts. Uh, my observation was that while maybe six to 10 years ago, we had a rough number of maybe 25% of people joining an MA program in design from another discipline. During the past years, it was uh, pretty much half of the learners would apply from different disciplines, such as computer science, um, business administration, engineering, and so forth. So um, bottom line here is uh, we're about to leave in the learning paths and the viability of educational silos, and we're entering nonlinear linear educational networks, or at least we should. Um, now, some symptoms that kind of, you know, we can observe today that relate to that shift is take a look at some of the degrees and job titles that are being invented all, all around the world. I mean, it's this and that design, da 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 da, da, da design and whatever. Um, interesting, but sometimes also, you know, worth questioning. Uh, we have a lot of middle-aged learners joining MA programs while coming from other disciplines and after being on the job for some while. Um, some of the learners who still want to specialize are more and more struggling because our modular uh, curricular structures are maybe catering the needs of these kind of, uh, let's call them, yeah, uh, lifelong learners or uh, these, these learners coming from different backgrounds and disciplines. Maybe, yeah, these structures are catering them more compared to learners who want to specialize sometimes. Um, also, one observation is that uh, you can see teaching staff and institutions having a hard time to adapt to that. People sometimes even are, are wearing out to the fact that they are, might be teaching on several programs or modules at the same time. Um, and another observation is also that more and more private players um, extend the educational uh, landscapes. So now one might ask, like, well, what have the schools been doing all that time since that? That's not something that just happened overnight, right? It's it's quite a uh, quite an ongoing shift and change. And um, I mean, as long as I've been studying and working in higher ed education, uh, we're still kind of <laughs> busy implementing the Bolognese system, at least in Europe. Uh, we're still struggling introducing new public management in higher education. Um, and at the same time, you know, while trying to adopt that, uh, that change to the educational silos that have been yeah, brought into the new millennium, uh, we I must say, I feel like we're more and more detaching from the non-academic world by sticking to these educational silos and ideas of the last century and millennium. Meanwhile, I mentioned before, uh, a lot of new players, they come in, uh, you might know some of these, uh, and extend the educational landscape. So nowadays it's pretty easy as a learner um, to engage in online learning programs. Um, just yesterday I watched um, an interview with the uh, the digital artist Beeple, who just sold a couple of his um, uh, NFTs for several million, uh, whatever currency he's using, <laughs> cryptocurrency he's using. And it was interesting to hear him, look, uh, I don't need any education to do that nowadays. I, uh, most of the software I use is open source and it's free. And there's hundreds of thousands of tutorials I can watch every day to kind of increase my knowledge. Um, so to become a successful in his uh, in his case a digital artist, you don't need you don't even need a design or arts education anymore if you if you want so. Now um, another phenomenon, and here I'm, I'm tying back to last year's um, VDF um, when Carl Vredenberg from IBM uh, joined the main stage talking about how. Um, 
uh, IBM launched a global initiative um, in educating uh, their own employees. And for a good reason, because as uh, he was reporting on an internal study that they've done, especially um, taking a look at people, at designers, so people from, uh, with a design background, studying design, for instance, joining uh, the corporate. And one of the main gaps they kind of discovered in, in their skill and uh, skill set was multidisciplinary collaboration. So it's, it's, un it's understandable that such a big corporate as IBM uh, kind of wants to fill in that gap, so they do it uh, internally. Um, so if we wrap up some of the challenges in educational design education, I can see a clear shift from linear to nonlinear to lifelong learning, and that, that requires new strategies. Um, there is a very slow process of introducing new public management versus a high-speed evolution that would be needed in education. And by high-speed evolution, I don't mean that we uh, all engage in online learning. We've been through that now. I think it needs more of a hybrid and new approach to that. Um, something uh, that is challenging uh, higher education is still stuck in institutional silos. And uh, all around us, we have an extending educational landscape or even markets that uh, we are competing with as, as, high, as, as public institutions. So um, for me as an educator, I, I see that we're, we're somehow at the dawn of new pedagogies in learning environments. Um, um, and there's opportunities there, but also challenges. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, we're kind of used to that idea that as designers, we, we're the ones changing everything and changing the world. But um, my observation here is design won't be enough. Um, and for the simple reason that uh, no single discipline will really be enough. So um, we, are, we are also stuck in our own um, disciplinary uh, silo, similar as many other disciplines. So what if we now take a look at the design at the dawn of new pedagogies. Uh, so as I said, um, design itself is being stuck in a disciplinary silo. And to be honest, it's an ongoing identity crisis that you can see being around if you take uh, half an hour and, 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 and search in the internet for uh, conferences and initiatives all around the future of design education. Well, we are on, on one ourselves right now. You will find quite a lot of them. So uh, we are, we're struggling ourselves here. Um, real multidisciplinary collaboration still is something many designers are struggling with or not even educated for. So, I mean, if I think back of, of, of the so-called interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary projects that have been offered at some of the programs where I have been working or studying, um, very often it ends up that you would have either a group of design students gathering together or from, from let's say, different design disciplines such as visual communication product design or service design, uh, or whenever it comes to a collaboration between, let's say, designers and engineers, at some point the group might kind of split to into someone taking care of the engineering part and someone taking care of, let's say, the visual part or something. So um, that's also something we're struggling in education with. Um, and something when it comes now to how to tackle the large change, so to speak, so let's say within a higher educational institution, um, we're not educate, being educated for engaging within hierarchical systems because we're used to pretty much the opposite in, uh, in our education. So that is also something we're struggling, uh, struggling with at, at, um, as professionals. Um, so what I would say, what design or designers might need to learn to kind of transition into that change that I was trying to outline is uh, first and foremost, collaboration with others. I see so many pro programs that are still organized and, 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 yeah, uh, and built around the belief of authorship and the exclusiveness of artistic practice and creativity. And um, I, I must say, um, if I take a look at molecular biologists or people in physics or engineering, they have very similar practice to ours sometimes. Uh, and what they do is sometimes much more creative than what I see is being done in the arts and design domain. So I don't, I wouldn't say that's, that's something exclusive to the us anymore. Um, and then here's a thought that, and I would like to connect uh, that to what uh, Christian uh, Gellerin uh, said yesterday, uh, the transition from a school of design, and that transition is needed 
uh, towards a school of managing agents and processes of, of design and change. And, and at sometimes at some places that is already taking place and at others, this is a, a real challenge. Um, now, what does that might that mean very, on, a, on a very concrete base for schools of design or programs of design? Uh, so one thing is really granting more agency to learners for different backgrounds, letting them come in with their backgrounds and maybe also having student-led and student-taught uh, parts of the curriculum that kind of leads to a real exchange between both uh, learners and educators and learners and educators from different backgrounds. Uh, so that means we need to develop curricula that are, that are more and more based on student-led and agile learning. By the way, agile learning is a, is a term coined by a colleague of mine. Uh, he's an expert in uh, pedagogy, Christoph Arn. Uh, from Switzerland, so uh, he coined that uh, that term agile learning, very worth while reading and investigating in. Um, it, it needs learning beyond institutional boundaries and that ties up to, to the previous speaker where the studio nowadays becomes an extended landscape or environment of uh, both institutional and non-institutional spaces or environments. And uh, maybe one thing we should get more and more familiar with when sitting within a larger institution, a university, so to speak, so to speak is offering minus and design to other disciplines. Very simple, but very uh, effective way to breaking up the silos. Um, now, two thoughts on what design can contribute to the shift that I've been talking about in this talk. Uh, well, one thing is natural lifelong learning. Um, I think uh, designers and design holds the transformative power to meet the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous sort of VUCA-ness uh, with several means such as critical thinking, by stating hypotheses, and that we are then able to turn into functional prototypes of, of what we call, could call hypothetical futures. And basically that, that is an engaging with um, uh, or bringing knowledge and skills into, into different contexts. And we do this with a human and plant-centered approach, usually um, by combining hard facts with soft facts. That is, by the way, something other disciplines um, are having an extremely hard time with because they're used to uh, measuring, monitoring, impact, and so forth. And we are very comfortable to, uh, to work with soft facts and turning them into evidence and uh, by creating new evidence or re relating to, uh, let's say, soft facts as evidence. So um, one of our strengths, I would say, is we, we, can, we are able to contextualize knowledge, our knowledge and skills into new contexts, new questions, new issues, new problems. And that's what I think makes us uh, natural lifelong learners. And that is sure something we can feed into that educational kind of change and shape that is ongoing. Now, the second thing that I think is, um, is something design and designers can contribute to the shift is what I call pedagogies of foresight. Now, many of you might be familiar with the Bloom's Pyramid or the Bloom's Taxonomy that is often represented as a pyramid that starts with the very basic um, uh, bottom of, of learning something, of remembering something, then extends into understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And, and most of the time when we think of arts um, and design, we kind of allocate ourselves in the upper part of that so-called pyra Bloom's Pyramid. Um, but I think something that we don't consider enough and that design really brings into that taxonomy or could bring into that kind of, yeah, um, so to speak, system of, of learning is foreseeing things. Uh, our capability or capacity to state a, pi a hypothesis, prototype that one, and, and and kind of you know try to foresee does that work? Is it is it is it solid or not? And this is a reason why I started kind of thinking uh, of the Bloom's taxonomy rather as a canvas that. Uh, in the design's case, puts the creation at um, at the core, at the center of, of let's say, uh, this, these relationships of learning and adds foreseeing uh, and strategic foresight as one of the key capacities that designers should develop or also bring into other disciplines um, as well. So I think um, that that's our strong part here, creating, analyzing, foreseeing and creating, right? Um, and this is uh, what I would like to share with you today. So that was um, 
my contribution called Design at the Dawn of New Pedagogies. Thanks for your attention. You can uh, reach out to me at my email or my blog, uh, janekert.ch, and I'm open and happy for questions. Or, uh, Thank you so much for, for the exciting presentation. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, so now is the time for to, for to ask questions from everyone. Um, so how do you see these, these recommendations moving forward? Like if you were to apply something today right now, so what was the first, what would be the first thing that you do? Yeah, I mean, I think um, at least at the institutions that I'm currently working at uh, and, and that I've worked in uh, in the past few years, um, curricular development is really a big topic now because um, while most of the curricula have been more or less introduced and established in the early 2000s, 2000s to 2010, at least in Central Europe where the Bolognese system kind of has been brought in uh, in the early 2000s, I think most curricula reached like a tipping point now. They, let's say an MA or BA program has been running for, let's say, 10 years now. And you see that they reached a certain tipping point of how they work both in terms of um, uh, sustainability with regards to their contents, their pedagogical approaches, but also in some, time, in some uh, uh, occasions also economically. So I think curricular, curricular development, uh, if you're an educator working in higher education, that is really the, one of the, of the main things to engage with right now. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we have a question from Balvir. Okay, is VUCA merely clutching a proverbial academic straws when the future of real employment is likely to be? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> this is exactly the vuca -ness that I'm talking about. Uh, all around us, uh, everything is becoming more and more VUCA. So, um, again, if, if I'm about to develop a curriculum right now, let's say a, a bachelor's curriculum, right? So, uh, Usually that takes around two years time, right? It's not gonna we're not gonna launch it next year. So let's say uh, two years, which is the minimum amount of time that is required, which means that uh, first students will graduate from that program in five years time. Now, um, how do we know uh, about the job world in five years time, considering what has been happening in the past five years? Uh, and we're talking really about massive changes all around. So I think um, if I had to kind of, you know, boil it down to one sentence is how do we teach our students and learners how to learn? That exactly. would be key. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, it's me reading here. Okay. I am interested to hear the logistical journey uh, in different, you know, uh, Type of, yeah, um, exactly. This business decisions. Ha. Huh. Yeah, that, that was a bit of the challenge that I was referring to uh, when uh, some of the institutions are still struggling with public uh, new public management being implemented. We all know the challenges of a matrix uh, organization with the line management in place and tasks being done all across the place. Um, uh, some institutions are more and more facing economical constraints. We all uh, constraints. We all know that. Um, nevertheless, I think um, again here collaboration and cooperation is is key to that. Uh, uh, let's say um, yes, you are in a situation where your department or your faculty or your program uh, is um, is struggling with keeping up with the hours and and the requested. Uh, or, or needed um, economical resources to run the program. So actually teaming up with other programs or other faculties or departments in your university could also be an opportunity to, to get that, that part in balance. Um, so I, I think both um, leaving, or this, leaving the silos is beneficial for both, uh, for the pedagogical approaches to our education and the content of our education, but also to, let's say, the, the organizational and economic constraints that, that we are struggling with. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is, that is an interesting question here. Now, how do we deal with learners who want to specialize, right? And here I have a very, a very good example. Um, uh, back in Switzerland, before I moved to Sweden recently, I I've been developing 
um, a master program that has been then developed into three programs uh, being design, service design and digital ideation, the latter uh, combining computer sciences and design. And um, of course, uh, we, we were also facing certain constraints, so it, it didn't exactly mean that we were about to, to run three separate curricula at the same time with three times the resources. So we ended up uh, creating one of the core modules of, um, of, of these three curricula being a pool of elective courses. And this is an, uh, an interesting case study compared to that, that feeds into this question because um, many people uh, would think like, oh, electives, that's something that, you know, uh, will end up having a lot of students doing a lot of different things and no one will be ever able to specialize. Um, and in our case, we extended from initially eight electives per semester into 28. So we, it, it was four times more than before, yeah. Nele. Um, and I must say exactly the opposite happened. Students started to specialize actually rather than, you know, getting lost in these ele electives. Because what happened was, um, the, the, well, I, I need to say there was one simple rule when it came to the electives. And that rule did not apply to the students choosing the electives, but to the educators providing and delivering these courses. And the simple rule or principle, it wasn't a rule, like I wouldn't go down control. It was a principle like um, the course should relate to the student's project as much as possible. So the first question, question being asked on these courses would be like, what are you working on? And that led to, to, uh, to students actually picking exactly the things that were necessary to like deepen their project. So um, this is maybe an, one example that uh, answers uh, Stigmo Hansen's question here, um, where I see, let's say, it's a good example where modular and elective structures actually cater both learners who would like to kind of broaden their learning experience, yeah. but also yeah. the ones who would like to deepen it. So um, it's, yeah, one does not necessarily exclude the other. Excellent. Yes, that, that's, that's exactly what we need today, actually. Yeah. Employer-led requirements. Um, okay. Um, I, I don't exactly mean what is meant by employer-led requirements here. But, uh, I, okay, uh, fueled by the commercial sector rather than education. I mean, this is an, uh, uh, this could be an extra conference about the term of <laughs> <laughs> the relationship be between what is called the commercial sector and education. But um, one thing, um, I must say commercial itself is one of these terms I, um, uh, I think is not adequate anymore because when you think very thoroughly and honestly about the higher educational sector, we are as commercial, to be honest, as many things that are happening outside, if we want or not. Um, so I think we, we're sitting in the same boat. Of course, we have an, um, what is called a private economy that somehow you know organizes around education or be it the other way around, higher education that needs sometimes to organize around that, that private uh, commercial sector. And there is clear and less clear relationships, uh, I think. Um, I would say the, uh, the benefit or the opportunity that we have uh, while being part of the public sector, by we, I mean public universities and higher educational institutions, is that... Um, uh, we might not have the same economical power, but we sure have, uh, when it comes to knowledge and skills, uh, a broader range of knowledge and skills on boards that we could use. And I say could because, of course, uh, this is again coming back to leaving the silos. How do we deal with that? So uh, let's say um, a large institution really wants to challenge the commercial sector. Actually, that institution would have all the, all the needed you know, manpower and, 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 and knowledge on board. But of course, we know that it's sometimes hard to get these these things started. So maybe that wasn't an exact uh, answer to the question being stated, but maybe it relates a bit to that uh, to that notion of commercial versus education. Brilliant. I mean, uh, we're going to have more opportunity to discuss in the panel. Uh, so stay with us in the broadcast studio. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you. Thank you so much again. This is fantastic. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's been an intense morning. Uh, lots of um, uh, communication in, in the chat. 
So I think that uh, now is the panel, so it's up to you to ask questions or of each other or what's happened so far. Uh, Andrew. I think this was the... Uh the impulse behind the question I asked at yesterday's session, um, in, in, where I asked the panel to reflect on possible negative impacts of uh, academia on art and design. And um, I mean, I've worked in art schools for 25 years and the point at which I went back into academia from after 10 years working in the glass industry um what i encountered was i don't know third generation modularity which seemed utterly inimical to creative practice it was this kind of different different rhythm altogether now i know that a lot a lot has developed since then but i can't help thinking that the academization of art and design practice you know, it's brought all kinds of benefits in terms of um, certain kinds of research and, and so forth. Um, but it's not entirely benevolent. And I think the point I've made in the chat is, is that design isn't a subject. Art is not a subject. Um, there isn't a subject to hide behind. Uh, you know, you're not working at arm's length. You're, you're absolutely the focus of the activity. It's a performance. Um, not, not many, uh, you know, not many subjects in higher education work in quite that way. Uh, I'd be interested in Frank's view of that because I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I, I thought. I thought Jan and, and Kai's presentations also absolutely in the moment uh, in terms of uh, the debate that we're having. So thanks to all of you for those. But but maybe that's an open question. I spent my time during the talk actually asking questions of myself as I was going through it and thinking. I'm steering, I'm going in the wrong path, I'm going off at a direction, etc. Then I suddenly realized that actually that's what my career has been as a designer and what I end up experiencing. Um, it's, it's such a strange profession, whatever you want to call it, calling, profession, activity, performance. Uh, I, I still don't know what it is. Um, I'm still going to try and find out over the coming decades um what what, I, what it is that i'm actually doing and the difficulty is i think is that when we can't articulate as designers what we are doing it makes it incredibly difficult for us to put any structure towards showing anybody or holding anybody's hand to take them on that journey it, uh, I, it is a difficult thing to articulate um it, it's an easy thing to do for designers but it's an incredibly difficult thing to articulate is somebody, somebody going to pick up on answering that <laughs> from Susanna <laughs> I mean, I'll have a go. I, I think I think this is a really, um, really good question. And what it is that ethics involves is not just theory, but practice. It's it's about behaviour. It's about what you do. And I take Susanna's point about research ethics, and uh, which is 
you know, very properly in academic terms, codified and, and observed and necessary. Um, but ethics in relation to creative practice um, is, a, is about what, how you act. It's about right action. <laughs> uh, um, Carrie has his hand up. Yeah. I have been discussing recently with many design schools and leaders of many design schools when mapping the needs. And I've noticed that there is the new trend for ethical design food design, thinking of bigger picture, how we can uh, have the, the food uh, sufficiently organized, how, to, how can we design the food delivery, the food um, uh, from growing to the uh, feeding the, the, the poor ones is one thing. Sustainable design, it's very, very, very ethical at this moment, green design. All these items which are now coming as a new big things. Uh, designers are trying to solve some big problems and I think it's very much linked to the ethics. Also from my point of view in the intellectual property uh, office we, we are kind of promoting these ethical uh, ethical standards and uh, yeah it's something we should maybe discuss further. Uh, I have a comment on that <clears throat> because I'm sometimes surprised by this kind of new discovery of uh, sustainability in design and sustainable design and it it ties a bit back to um, uh, your observation before on, on uh, the RCA's initial mission of being designed as a commercial driver uh, that then have been has been criticized by um, by figures such as uh, Victor Papanek or nowadays maybe Arturo Escobar could be uh, one of these uh, figures uh, criticizing um, yeah, similar approaches on a, on a global level. Um, but I think some, uh, or at least for me personally, one important figure in design history that has been drastically overseen is Tomas Maldonado, um, the former and last director of the Ulm School of Design in Germany in the late 50s. And Tomas came uh, to Europe uh, in the 50s to, from Argentina and, and he was the one actually <laughs> starting off arguing with uh, Max Bill at the time, uh, the director of the Ulm School, um, who of course kind of brought, being a former Bauhaus student, brought in a lot of, um, uh, of Gropius uh, thoughts and thinking into the Ulm School as well. And uh, Maldonado was the one to question that heavily because uh, uh, he was convinced, and I must say <laughs> that was a fair observation, that you uh, you couldn't uh, compare post-war Europe uh, to the Europe of the um, yeah uh, of 1918 and so forth. Uh, and he was actually the one coming up, and, uh, and I really recommend reading his text from the 50s and then later on with the social notion uh, of design pretty early on and, and the social responsibility that designers hold. And that was long, that was, I mean, uh, 20 years before Papanek even turned up uh, with his critique of the design of design for the real world. So um, I am really sometimes surprised how this, this nowadays becomes this great discovery. And by the way, I must say my critique about Escobar, who is like promoting this thinking a lot uh, in these days in his writings, he didn't even cite Maldonado in no, none of his books. Uh, I'm really surprised how and why this is a, this sort of big discovery. It's been there all the time, uh, pretty much all the time. It's uh, Of course, there's periods where um, the commercial aspect or employability have been articulated a bit more compared to other factors. But uh, the social responsibility and the responsibility that nowadays, uh, uh, and by social I would refer to um, uh, to social uh, um, to entities, both human entities and non-human entities. So referring a bit to actor network the theory here, uh, the social responsibility of design and designers has been there from the very first beginning. So uh, uh, I disagree a bit here. Like uh, for me, that is uh, it's it's neither a new discovery nor it's something that we need to add. It, it, it needs to be rearticulated maybe because it, it, it it's. It's been in the background maybe for some years. 
I like the question about shall we have more fun in class? I mean, that's that's an exciting one because I, I when Andrew was speaking, I was looking at the pictures of the studio and the paint everywhere and the mess, and it just makes me think that when I now go to institutions and go to their their studios, their their rooms, etc., they're so pristine, they're so clean. You you can't make a mess because it's probably. Uh, X million pounds of European funding that's created a beautiful floor and the architects have done it and the interior design has been in there, etc. But you cannot mess it up. And I think this is something that's really been lost, especially, I mean, my experience mainly in terms of the UK. You go into what were art schools, which are probably very old Victorian buildings, and you could splash paint around. You could hammer nails into the floor. You could make a mess. And now you can't you virtually are in a sterile environment and i think that that really is a bit of an issue and and andrew's presentation of the studio um really brought that home to me is i don't see that anymore in in, in design studios in, in universities absolutely disagree here i must say <laughs> it cannot be applied to any situation uh, i hardly i really disagree here and maybe i'm 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 stating this also on the purpose of provocation here <laughs> i see a lot of graduates struggling uh, to find even or acquire the vocabulary to communicate with non-designers so no i, I as a design educator, I don't see our students and learners being educated to apply the mental models or their toolkit to any situations. I think this is something we really fall short of in many, many places. There are good examples, of course. That's why I said I'm, I'm kind of uh, overemphasizing this. But I think we need to be aware that um, uh, there, there is something missing in our current tool or skill uh, set that is being taught at, at schools of arts and design all around the world and that uh, would establish this connection or this kind of uh, transferability of knowledge. And, and, uh, and it's not an easy thing. That's what other disciplines are struggling with too. Can I uh, just respond to Penny's question on the screen, which uh, is also in a way my uh, answer to Gonzalo's question for all of us to identify one critical challenge for design and what would that be? And, and I, think, um, I think the answer to Gonzalo's question is very much about sustainability and, and diversity. It has to do with the great big the big issues, questions of our time, but um, but as a design assignment for today, I think it's to redesign the studio as a post-institutional space. I, I, I would add in terms of sustainability, I, I, I've yet and I struggle to find a, a, a good enough definition of sustainability for, for, for myself. Um, I think one of the critical things is designers must must uh, engage in discussion, in debate, in a wider context to understand the meanings of sustainability, not just to accept sustainability, but to be able to argue for sustainability, to be able to articulate what it means. I struggle with it. I, uh, for, for me, one of the most sustainable things as an example moving forward was the fourth road bridge where you started painting it and by the time you got to the end of it um, you needed to, to to start painting it again um, that was sustainable for jobs um, and, and employment and sustainable society uh, had they have had sustainable paint at the time the jobs would have gone um, so I think there's you know there are issues that designers need to come to terms with in terms of how they articulate how they argue and, and and debate and i find sometimes it's very difficult to engage in wider conversation with design students other than a narrow definition of design uh you know one of the things i always say is stop 
stop just reading design magazines and pick up magazines, pick up science magazines, pick, pick up Harvard Business Review, pick up I, whatever, you know, material science magazine. Just get 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 out of design. But the, the, the more we do it, the, 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 the more convergent and narrower it, it becomes. And the profession has some issues to deal with itself in this direction. I mean, we struggle at the society with this, how, how, how we actually widen the scope for debate and whether it's possible to widen the scope for debate. Um, you, in the current world in which we live, uh, a lot of debate is being closed down rather than being opened exactly. up. Um, and, and these are political issues as much as anything else. Um, uh, so I think critical issue for design, designers must start talking, but they, in order to do that and articulate, they must know how to think philosophically. Maybe in response to the question, ah, oh, sorry, no, jump in. <laughs> sorry, uh, Curry. But Susanna was asking me to elaborate on the studio as a post-institutional space. And um, I think that what that comment reflects uh, a long-standing concern that the very notion of a subject, of, of the subject, becomes an impediment to learning um, at various points in terms of creative practice. And yet so much is invested in the notion of subject you know curriculum design and validation contracts of employment um institutional hierarchy and so on and so forth and and i also think that what's happening what's been happening in the uk for a uh, quite some considerable time is a distortion of the purpose of learning um what i think of as the uh hostile takeover of the education system by the assessment industry. So that actually the exam factory is, is, is the thing that is kind of driving behavior and managerial decision-making as well as funding shortages and whatnot. And I guess you would probably know that you would know that you were in a post institutional space when you started thinking differently in those terms w without those kinds of um constraints or or distortions that's um n n not a comprehensive ans answer but at least it stretches the uh the question a bit further so fantastic oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean Ah, just maybe two notions I've seen uh, sustainability popping up in the comments and the term sustainability and as sometimes I ask myself what is it really that we want to sustain <laughs> if we take a look at the mess all around us so um, there I see uh, uh, personally I prefer uh, talking of a uh, transition and I think there's also at Carnegie Mellon currently the, the term of transitional or transition design being coined which I think is a really important interesting one or uh, at least an, a more suitable uh, term compared to sustainability um, and then there was a question in between somewhere like what is um, the key challenge or the key the core thing that we should uh, address in, in, in design or education um, and I think um, when you said uh, is design education too important to leave it entirely to design educators which kind of ties back to <laughs> i think it was tim brown saying is design too important to leave it to designers and i must say yes i agree because i see that that being exactly the the, the core challenge here as designers um, uh, or educating designers we fall short to educate them to again communicate and collaborate with non-designers which is most of our planets <laughs> human population so uh, yes I, I totally agree here we need to bring on in other competences other people um, and the same way they might be struggling to come into design education uh, the same way we are struggling when whenever we engage with other fields sometimes so I think that kind of area of friction needs to be actually uh, taken advantage of to you know um, to free some new and emerging uh, pedagogies, approaches, 
uh, critique uh, and, and much more. I think one of the other challenges as well, is, and, and, and Carrie obviously is working in this area, is the own, is, it becomes how designers understand the ownership of ideas, the ownership uh, of, of things created or the shared ownership of, of, of things created. And I think, I think moving forward, that's going to be a really um, critical issue within the design profession. Um, because we we often you know talk about the, the intellectual property is the currency of design. Um, it, it, it's what you can actually transfer and, and get a value from. But with so much now that is free, is open source, um, and, and that's the, 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 the sort of a democratic uh, route that that one goes down. It makes it. Uh, Carrie, I'm going to be interested now to hear what you say to that. Ah, you're on mute. You're on mute. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have had a very interesting discussion about exactly the same subject with the European uh, University Association. Um, uh, there are two things. Um, there is um, education and awareness about the possibilities. And this is what we do in our, our project. We are trying to provide information on, for young young artists, young designers, young writers, that uh, if you are thinking of continuing this part and want to make a living on this, there are these options. Um, let's say that uh, from the university point of view, um, very many universities are using the intellectual property um, registration uh, as an index of that we are in innovative university. Uh, it's kind of indexation. And it's a little bit contradictory, I have to admit. But the point is that if a young designer knows that I can put my things on the open uh, common creatives and uh, I can have my name mentioned every time my, my idea, my design is uh, uh, used by others, it's all right. If somebody wants to register it and try to uh, profit somehow out of it, uh, students should be informed about that. What are the options? What are the possibilities? And when we are speaking about intellectual property education, this is the one we want to promote creativity, innovation, and boost young people to, to know what are their options. And uh, from that angle, it doesn't seem so contradictory. At the same moment, the European Union is boosting on open, um, open uh, science. Uh, approach. It's coming more and more and it's linked to the kind of how science research are published and they are very often hidden by behind the pay, uh, paywalls and that's a totally other business but it's an interesting area um, but I would encourage everybody to, to, to learn the basics of IP in order to make a kind of a, intelligent choice how they are using uh, their innovation or their design. So that's the point. That could be an extended discussion, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> discussion of ownership. I was just thinking uh, in, in, a, in a post Bartiz uh, scenario, who doesn't really own things anymore? I mean, and Bartis wrote that piece of text, what is it now, 70 years ago. Um, uh, but but uh, there's a nice quote that come in, it comes into my mind by Italian composer Luciano Berio. And there was a fantastic documentary on his work. Um, unfortunately, I think it, it, it got lost somewhere on YouTube and so, or something. It's hard to find it. So Luciano Berio being that um, experimental composer. And um, there was one fantastic scene in that documentary where he sits uh, in, an, in a rehearsal room with a percussionist and reads out the, the score of, 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 his, of the piece that he has written which is mainly consisting of words, not of notes. And the percussionists, uh, the drummer starts to interpret that. So the question is who owns the piece at that moment? And uh, Luciano Berio is being asked that question at the very end of, of the documentary. Uh, are you afraid uh, whenever you write a piece and hand it over to let's say a group of people performing it, an orchestra? And, and he says, not at all because um, 
there is no such thing that would exist without anything else existing or any entity existing before. And re he refers to his way of composing and creating as a way of a journey uh, that kind of uh, moves on each and every time his pieces are being reinterpreted um, or recreated. And I think this relates to a lot of things that we do nowadays as designers too, especially when it comes uh, to the collectiveness of, uh, of what could be called project making when referring to Mancini. So um, I see ownership, even if it's kind of having a, a quite a recent revival with, within the digital world with NFTs uh, and so forth. Uh, this is sure one of the terms that I would criticize most in, within the design context. Um, this is a massive question, Susanna. Uh, and I, I think the, in an institutional context, the, the answers to that probably come from outside <laughs> rather than can be found inside. Um, and the, the, the something that we haven't really focused on in this morning's session, which but but which is part of the studio in a way, <clears throat> um, and certainly material to this debate is the whole question of dialogue, and I mean genuine dialogue, not the sim the transactional exchange of already existing points of view. Um, so in dialogue, in dialogue where where you, in true dialogue where you where there is no um, preconceived uh, agenda or outcome for a conversation, the conversation is allowed to develop itself, and um, that can take you into a space that is completely free of the kinds of constraints that we all we all find. Uh, to a degree unbearable uh, from time to time. And, and um, I suppose, the, I suppose the, the kind of dark thing I'm saying is that I'm not sure that fighting the institution would lead to a happy ending <laughs> uh, because it's bigger than you are. And uh, it's very set in its ways. Um, I don't mean your institution, I mean the institution. Um, and a little bit like that quote from Stuart Brand on, in, on architectural institutions, they don't like change. So fi finding um, a community uh, of practice or um, a, a series of conversations that take you out of that space and into a different space can feed the work that you do um, within the institution and it will also connect you to other people um, within the, the institution that feel exactly the same way that you do. Absolutely. I think, the, I, I think it's so important that designers don't stop fighting I mean, I think designers have to fight. They, 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 they fight almost every day to justify what it is that they do or to explain what they do. And that fight is an incredibly internal fight, um, you know, grappling with what it is, what it is that makes you a, 
a designer, the fact that you can, can you actually can you interact with other people who are not designers? Um, it, it, it's just a way of thinking. It's a way of life that can really put a lot of people off, to be quite honest, in terms of if you're a designer, when you're there being so nerdish about things, when you're there discussing the details or somebody somebody says something, you think, no, there's a, there's a better way to do it. You can become incredibly contradictory in, in, in terms of other people. I, th I think it's, it's something I find I, I struggle with in, in, in terms of saying, no, my, my way uh, is, is a way I've thought about it. I've been thinking about it so long, I've got it right, et cetera, et cetera. And then how you, how you actually work with other people to convince them. And it, but you really are fighting all the time to, to, to actually put a stake in the ground to say, these are my views, this is what I'm, this is what I'm thinking. That's interesting. And again, I think that's not something that is an exclusively limited to designers. No. Maybe the different is the difference is that we used to deal with a lot of everyday things that we have in common with other people too, be it a physical artifact, a digital environment, or whatever it is. So we are concerned about these things that are to be found in other people's lives too. Uh, I think, you know, a computer scientist, uh, someone working in machine learning is as nerdish as we are <laughs> or nerdy as we are in, in his or her kind of context. It's just that um, it rarely happens that we, we discuss these matters because they're not to be found maybe yet uh, um, in our daily lives to a certain extent as, as design does in, in, in many ways. But I think I was interested in, in, in your presentation where you put create at the center and then you put to the foresight to foresee. I think that is that's a particular thing about design is the scenario planning that goes on mm -hmm. inside your head all the time C can go a lot faster than somebody who's not, not not trained in that respect, but doesn't have that design approach. And it, that puts, is you out, it puts you out of sync at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. There is, we're, we're reaching the end of the session, right? No, I mean, I mean, no, no. I mean, Carrie, Carrie has not. Uh, I feel that Carrie wants to say something, and uh, we have, we have gone over. Yeah, we've gone over six <laughs> minutes so far, but yeah, but it's so it's really engaging and interesting, and I feel so I feel so bad of, of, about cutting it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that the period of COVID has been very difficult for many professions, and I'm I'm dealing a lot with teachers and. Um, the recent studies made in the, by the, among the teachers are showing that quite many are totally over, uh, exhausted by the, the, the problem of uh, either being distance teaching, face-to-face -face teaching, hybrid teaching, and you have to have a different approach in everything. But there are a lot of other professions where people are feeling exhausted. And um, you have all my sympathy, Susanna, um, I think that each individual who are feeling exhausted should look for help, uh, not from designers, but from um, experts on that. And this is my, my, my thing, what I want to say. I think, I think the first line of resistance is not to, is to try not to internalize the institution. Um, you know, don't let it, don't let it in. Um, and if you, if you manage to do that, then you won't become institutionalized. And um, that's probably the easiest way of saying something that is actually a very difficult and complex <laughs> balancing act and juggling act and just about every other circus uh, act uh, that you like to name um but um you know the the biggest risk is is isolation and i think to come back to what uh, Kyrie was saying that is one of the most damaging um effects of the pandemic uh lockdown was that so many people found themselves um utterly isolated um uh but having networks having conversations like this is you know what left terrace has put together 
over the course of these two days, um, you know, people will be drawing energy uh, from this. And I'll keep it going uh, for a while. Until also, then. we have many conversations with Design Education Talks podcast, 60 episodes yeah. on all these matters. So people can also go to that for for encouragement and uh, analysis. I mean, I really don't want to, to uh, end this uh, panel uh, unless somebody has anything else to add. Uh, would you like to take a half an hour break or a 40 minute break? Half an hour gets us up to our time or 40 minutes gets us just over 10 minutes over our time. What, what's better for everyone, you think? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do half an hour? Yeah. Make a decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do half an hour because that's the only break we're having. And then because we're finishing the conference and then there's the workshop at the end, which you've all received information for four. So you'd also like to register for that. There's only 18 places in that workshop. All, all the participants have received. I sent an email this morning to all the participants. So if, if it's of, of interest to you, there's only 18 places. Uh, and we yeah, and we continue the conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a real pleasure having all of you. A fantastic, uh, fantastic mix. Of, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.